This is Off Planet Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy is off today, so I'm flying solo. And before we get started, I want to thank all of the people who are supporting us over on Patreon. We really appreciate it. You're making shows like this possible. And I have a a, a returning guest today, an amazing guest who hasn't been with us in quite a while, and uh, she is the uh, author of Chemtrails, Harp, and, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth, Under an Ionized Sky, and uh, she has more work upcoming, and so here to discuss, you know, the what's going on in the sky, what's going on in our body, and the metaphysics and psychology of it all. Alana Freeland, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Thanks for having me, Emily. Go, always good to see you. Excellent. All right, so it's been a while, and um, you and I had a conversation before we started, and we'll get into some of that stuff as this, you know, as this rolls out, but um, you're kind of going on a little mini speaking tour here in Southern California, and so this kind of came back across my radar after kind of a while. It's been a while since we've covered, um, well, we, we, do, we do regular shows with Sean Gautreaux, so we do kind of cover what's going on in the sky from... His, yes. you know, his, his most unique lens. I still, I still think he is the most unique, has the most unique view of anybody. <laughs> in, <laughs> actually, in I, actually, I tried to talk Sean into Skyping in to one of the MUFON events this next yeah. week, but uh, he, he wasn't up for it. But he has given me permission to use some of his clips, and I'm going to. Yeah, I, I just, th that, you know, there's something, you know, I appreciate so much of the work that goes on in this alternative space, but every once in a while, there's somebody really special with a really totally different, unique take on something comes along. And the, I remember the first time I heard and saw his work, I was captivated and, and he's become a good friend and I enjoy many aspects of him. But yeah, I, th I still think his work is probably the most underappreciated in this area. <laughs> right. Pe people can go and see uh, what is in our skies. Right? Yeah. That's his site. Yeah, he's a regular guest on our show, and so other than, but that he, that's really been the only sort of sky work we've been doing for the last couple of years. We had Matt Landman on maybe a year ago or whatever, but it's been a while, and so I decided to touch back in with you, and since we spoke last time, you've had a new book. It's been out for a while, so it isn't that new anymore, um, and, you know, it's your Space Fence book, so I think a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with it because they see you on, on some other programs. And some of where I want to go with this today is a little bit different, but for those who aren't familiar with, with your you know, more recent work, do you want to kind of give us a, an up-to-date on, on where you're at and what you're doing with this? Right. Can we start, Emily, with what you said before we went on the air about uh, your protectiveness of listeners who really may not want to hear more bad news? <laughs> so sure I actually like some of this stuff about the psychology and the metaphysics I was saving for the second hour but if you would like to get into it in the first hour let's just go for it I told Al Alana when we first kind of got on the recording here that you know part of the reason that I hadn't had her back sooner or we hadn't had her back is not um, because we're unappreciative or even not, not in agreement with her work I mean but because of you know the um, what some of this stuff does to a human being psychologically metaphysically not only when they begin to um hear about it but then when their thoughts sort of begin to interact with this concept of what's going on and not you know some of it is even for my own myself like you know i stopped listening to a lot of information and just more engaged in my day-to-day -day life and found joy and happiness and you know a lot of <laughs> a lot of listeners a, a lot of listeners you know they I remember when I was in that space where all I did was consume information and it became overwhelming and a lot of listeners are kind of in that spot. And so sometimes it was like, well, do I want to give them, you know, not that, do I want to give them more bad news? Some of the, some of this information feels hopeless, oppressive. Um, and you know, some of the people out there, um, are delivering it with the intent to cause fear. So I do believe that there are some not wholesome actors in this space that like the amount of fear, hopelessness it creates. I don't count you among them. No. Right? I, 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 you know, I, I know that the stuff that your research is, is right on and it is what ha what's happening. And that makes it 
harder to accept than somebody who's out there just intentionally pounding fear because you can say it, ignore them, right? So that's kind of been some of, you know, what's happened here. So I wanted to ask you, I just, there was part of me that was nervous to do this show because of this. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, how do we balance this problem of people, people need to not have their head in their sand, the sand. They need to understand what is true. And they also need to be able to function, live happy, healthy lives and understand their own creative power to, you know, transmute and uh, transcend some of this, right? So what say you? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I'm not a fan of, of transcendence, by the way. Uh, I'm a fan of imminence. Ah. Imminence is go deep into it ah. and you will find the way. Mm. So um, I think when I say transcendence, I don't mean it in the new age uh, icky way. I mean Get out of, of it. Yeah, yeah, get above it. Yes. Above it. No, I'm I'm not a fan of that. Hmm. But I let me let me tell you how I look at it. And okay. I I I don't have fear. I don't I mean when I first started this eight years ago and we became friends with Clifford Carnicum, the independent scientist who was doing the earliest work on um, trying to figure out what those jets in the azure blue skies of northern New Mexico were really spewing out their back end. Mm -hmm. He knew it was not contrails. He knows what ice crystal condensation looks like. And this was lasting longer than 30 seconds and was mm -hmm. leaving behind it a huge sort of cirrus cloud cover. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he, uh, he's the one who got me into this. I always blame him. Because, uh, <laughs> Because <laughs> we were friends in northern New Mexico. I was living in Santa Fe then. I'm back in the Pacific Northwest now. And uh, I, be, I had a biology background, uh, couldn't decide which way to go in undergrad. And so uh, I had not really done anything with my biology background until meeting Clifford. And he began looking for specimens for his work. And I was one of them. We had mm -hmm. about a couple of dozen people in the Santa Fe area. And that included the red wine test where you clean your mouth and then you slosh mm -hmm. it around and spit it into a clean dish and uh, notice the fibers just right there. Right? Mm -hmm. You've already cleaned your mouth. It's not gum tissue. It's, it's fibers and they move. They move yeah. on their own. <laughs> they do. <laughs> so, uh, so, that was the first thing and then we did the blood tests and I looked at my blood under a slide and most of my uh, red blood cells were perfectly round but the ones that had some sort of critter sticking its head into the uh, the the cells was uh, and sucking the iron out of my blood then my blood uh, cell would be distorted and sort of weird shaped so so that got my attention and mm -hmm. I realized that Clifford was right that you know just by induction alone to figure out that hey we're all breathing the same atmosphere so did you have any resistance at first to what he was saying not at all ah. because I'd been studying our American government for what 20 years yeah I mean what can I say I mm -hmm. already had Plenty yep. of horror stories about MK Ultra. Yeah, and uh, so no, no, I know where I live, yeah. and you know, <laughs> even when I was living in Europe, I came back because you know I always say, and I'm not quite joking. I want to go down with the Titanic, right? And I want to witness what's going on. Uh, this yeah. is the country that my Romanian grandmother sought refuge in uh, from Romania. Uh, uh -huh. She was a Roma, and um, and it was terrible over there. I mean, you want to, you know, Americans want to know what terrible is. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. it ain't terrible here yet. Okay, and so I don't have a lot of patience with people who want to feel good all the time. Mm -hmm. I really don't, because this is our nation, so called. This is our life. This is one of the great themes of this time: is technology. Yep. And so for people who say to me, oh, I, I don't like technology. I don't want to, I don't, I never liked science in high school. Well, you know, I want to say, so what? So what? 
<laughs> this is your time. And you can't learn everything about technology, neither can I. I, you know, I can go so deep and then I need to call on the science guys. And I have, a, I have several science guys that I do call on, bless their hearts. Um, so for me, in, uh, knowledge is power, not information. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people do not. Yep, I agree. You, you equate the two, you're wrong. Mm -mm. Knowledge is, uh, it comes from the word gnosis. Mm -hmm. And gnosis has to do with immediate, imminent knowledge. Mm -hmm. What you, you, you intuit. Yep. You've taken in a lot of information, and then suddenly you get it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's knowledge. I always say, like to say that information is out there, answers are only in here. So it's kind of like where you come to with that information you took in, that inner sense of knowing for sure. That's right. But you do need the information. Yeah. It is not good enough to say, oh, I'm intuitive. No. I don't need information. No, you need information. Mm -hmm. And then like a cow with four stomachs, you can digest it. And out the other end, maybe that's not a good metaphor, <laughs> <laughs> will come knowledge. And the yeah. knowledge is power. And do the global elites know that? Oh, yes, they know that. They have, they have ferreted away very important data for centuries. Mm -hmm. And only now in this Tesla age are they bringing it out for their scientists to work on. And that would be the Jasons. If you mm -hmm. don't know who the Jasons are, you need to know who the Jasons Jason are. Jason Society? The Jason Society? Jason Society, yeah. yes. Yeah. These are the guys who get the creme de la creme of Tesla stuff. Mm -hmm. So now we have a president sitting in the White House whose uncle, John Trump, mm -hmm. was the one who, to whom was passed off the papers stolen from Tesla at his death in 1943. So it's, uh, it's obviously the theme. And now we get to Catherine Austin Fitz, who is a really big fan of mine. She's done a lot for me. She's bought dozens of copies of the books and passed them out to people. Uh, she's published me and her Solari report several times. So Catherine is the one who started talking, she and James P. Farrell, about uh, the secret space program. And so, you know, I've studied that as well. Um, and uh, that is what this is all from. And uh, a lot of it has to do with various experiments going on in our ionized atmosphere and in the uh, near Earth orbit around the Earth, just right around the Earth. So those, those are huge. And for people who think, oh, well, I'm just going to sign a petition and have them get rid of chemtrails, that ain't going to happen. No. That ain't going to happen. So, uh, so do I seem hopeless and forlorn about this? No, but I, I recognize that there's way too much at stake now. Are we just collateral damage for the military industrial intelligence complex who is totally committed to a space age? No, we're not just collateral damage. We're being experimented on also. And that is a fact and we have to get used to that. So to me, um, yeah, it's kind of like the asbestos age that we went through and the nicotine age and whatever else, whatever chemicalized environment that we have sort of wiggled our way through, but this is much bigger. This is, this is global. Mm -hmm. And this is coming down from the upper atmosphere and we are breathing it in. So, so that's the reality. Uh, but I think I'd like to start uh, so anyway, I think that's all I can say, Emily, is, uh, you know, if people uh, don't see the power in knowledge and that I am spending years of my life bringing it to the people mm -hmm. and uh, translating heavy duty science and a lot of it's too heavy duty for me. I can't translate. <laughs> right. Yeah, I bring what I can to awaken people to their condition. Mm -hmm. so that they can take care of themselves because the doctors don't know you think medical school is preparing them for this not at all you're wrong yeah. so 
uh, you know, and we now know that the vaccination program is a delivery system. We now know that the GMO foods are a delivery system. And we also now know that the jets, the rockets, and the drones are a delivery system. All of these things are delivering things into our atmosphere that we then breathe. And part of them are about their particular operations, the military industrial intelligence complex operations. But a couple of those operations have to do directly with us and the agenda 21, 2030, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. the lockdown on human society because they are committed to a space age. And part of the commitment to the space age begins with absolute full spectrum dominance uh, over planet earth and all creatures on it and everything in it. I mean, you, you talk about hubris, you talk about psych, uh, you know, uh, sociopaths. Yes, but this is what they believe is that they can't uh, dominate the solar system until they have absolute control over their own planet. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at. That's where I, I assume we are at, and I'm certainly not the only one. So let me just read off to remind people who might have heard me before, because I'm sure I said it before, but I've developed this list much more. There are basically seven operations going on in our ionized atmosphere. And when I say ionized, what I mean is it's loaded with electrons. And they've all been, they're basically, the beginning of activating them had to do with HARP, the famous mm -hmm. acronym that couldn't have been better. Angels don't right. Like HARP, right? <laughs> There's no mistake so, to this stuff. <laughs> right. So the HARP was uh, about, oh, I'd say a decade of experiments going on with the ionosphere, which surrounds our planet and is inside our magnetosphere, which is much bigger. So what they wanted, it's called the ionosphere because it's loaded with ions. It's loaded with electricity, basically, electrical things, positive and negative both. So they wanted to see how they could turn our atmosphere into a mini ionosphere by controlling the ionosphere itself. And um, Bernard Eastlin was the guy who wrote several patents about how to do this. Mm -hmm. He definitely saw how to do it. He would use something called cyclotron resonance. And that has to do with the Schumann resonance of uh, 7.83 and how mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all sort of resonating with the Schumann resonance. But now we're gonna have the ionosphere uh, and uh, they want to be able to control that as well. All the frequencies, all the frequencies of life on earth. And it was the beginning of a very, not just an electrical age, which really began in the 19th century, but an electromagnetic age. And so um, that's, that's kind of how it started. And then it went to figuring out how to do these seven operations. And the first one, as we all know, is weather engineering. Mm -hmm. Is all the weather being engineered? Yes, it is. To my knowledge, it is all engineered as soon as it arises uh, in the South Pacific. Now, there mm -hmm. are nat natural things arising in the South Pacific. They're immediately taken up by the geoengineers, and, uh, and the weather is, uh, is moved in a general eastern uh, direction after going north and bypassing your state, California, so that a nice, healthy, unhealthy drought can be maintained now for eight years. Mm -hmm. And that would include the few floods. You have mm -hmm. to include that because what they would have been experimenting on when they did the floods was to see what the saturation was. Mm -hmm. Because the soil now is uh, stuffed with aluminum oxide, with uh, mm -hmm. nanoparticles of aluminum. And so uh, there's a lot of experimentation. In fact, I would say I am not particularly uh, believing that this is genocide, that this is eugenics in the typical way. I would say that they're more interested in using us as guinea pigs 
Mm -hmm. and hacking into the computer records of doctors, hospitals, clinics, dentists, whatever, so they can see what the uh, fallout actually is for this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be my guess. Uh, do you think, do you think it would, it, that it, you know, you're talking about them hacking in to do that? Do you also think that that is probably part of a push for having like Medicare for all or a nationalized healthcare system or not a private insurance system so that all of that information is there ready and available. They don't have to hack in. Everything is just wired into all their other stuff already. But that's you... right. Uh, that's what the UK has done for, for since yeah. the end of world war two. Yeah. I mean the, you know, the UK, I lived there for a few years. It is definitely socialism. Yeah. It is not a democracy. Yeah. Well, if you look into, have... yeah, if oh, you look into, if you look into the history of like Kaiser Permanente, that hospital, which is very big here in California, there's always been some devious, weird combination with government and funky experimenting and stuff like that going on. So uh, if it yes. sounds like too good of a deal to be true, it, it always is. <laughs> well, it, well, and like uh, for MKUltra, it was Tavistock Institute mm -hmm. in England. They're yes, the all ones, about it. <laughs> they're the ones who taught our CIA psychiatrists what to yes. do and how to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So the weather engineering is essential for, first of all, power, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a no brainer. You can tell Iran to behave itself or tell it what you want, or you just take their rain away. You control the jet stream and you move their rain somewhere else and they die. So this is very powerful technology, but that's not the only reason that it's number one. It also can be used to create energy to keep the lower atmosphere ionized. Mm -hmm. And that would be thunderstorms with lots of lightning or making Birkeley currents in uh, the atmosphere now, uh, making Alvin waves. There are all these technical terms of just different plasma events that can now be created right here and plasma being the fourth state of matter, it's actually not the fourth state, I think. I think it's the first state of matter. But mm -hmm. what they can do is, is create plasma. Most of the clouds you see in the sky now, are weird. they are not moisture clouds, they're plasma mm -hmm. clouds. Well, they so, all have this like shiny iridescence on yes. them, right? They're all like opalescent or with a shimmer or a glitter on them, yeah. And ragged edges, and they just, yeah. they don't look like, but, but what do new generations know? I mean, yeah, I know yeah. what clouds used to look Every like. Every once in a while, you have a day where you get some good old-fashioned clouds, or either that or they have, you know, the, a machine that, to make them look more real for people like <laughs> us or something, right? Like one day, I was, when I was driving to, through the, the Southwest, I was driving to Arizona, and I'm driving, and I'm like, wow, these are magnificent clouds. These are like, when I was little, these are amazing, right? And then I get to one area, and off far, far in the distance, I see these things rising off of something on the ground and coming into the air. I'm like, this fool's some kind of cloud making machine, <laughs> right? Like they looked like the kind when you were little that you would yeah. be like, oh, there's a bunny rabbit, there's a dog. <laughs> well, they were, that, that was the WASAC, that was the uh, wet surface air cooler uh, yeah. technology making real clouds with real moisture. And you recognized what moisture, of course, you know, I mean, water yeah. always, Round, has a round form. Round, yeah. So you get those wonderful kinds of clouds. You don't get, ra you don't get rain shards, you get rain drops. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so, okay, weather engineering, that's number one. Then um, the next one that I have down is the chemical electromagnetic uh, atmospheric operations. And that's, that, that's, that's a lot of stuff. That's plasma. That's, they're farming antimatter, believe it or not, up there. Yeah. They're making Birkeland currents. They're making Alvin Whiff Whistler waves. They're making uh, uh, electromagnetic fields that they mess around with. They so when you say farming antimatter, do you mean like pulling that energy out of the ether like what Tesla would talk about? Hmm. Is that what yeah. you mean? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but uh, they can actually create more from it. Right. Well, isn't all that kind of, I mean, it, it's over unity. So you can create more than you use by doing it. Right. Yes. So, okay. Very yeah. good. That's right. Yeah. Over unity. Good one, Emily. Okay. And then, um, okay. So the next one, that's, that's the second operation, chemical electromagnetic. Then we have planetary geophysical operations. And this would be where I would put the California fires. 
Okay, I want to get into this in a little while because I have a lot of, you know, a lot to say about this. <laughs> yes, yes, that's where I would put that. Uh, what did you call that again? Uh, planetary geophysical operations. Changing okay. shorelines, changing mm -hmm. uh, structures of counties, cities, um, for, you know, agendas. That Zoning and political purposes. Run by the UN. Mm -hmm. or by the uh, global elite who want, you know, they want those shorelines for themselves or the Chinese mm -hmm. who own a lot of the California shoreline. So, um, all right. So then uh, that is also where I mentioned earlier, I just want to give you his name, the Soviet astronomer, Nikolai Kardashev. Mm -hmm. Kardashev is the one who came forward uh, with this idea that there are three phases to actual uh, domination of, of the galaxy. I yeah. mean, the hubris of this is like unbelievable. But the first stage is full spectrum dominance of planet Earth. The second is control over on one star, over our star, over our sun mm -hmm. systems. And that is already underway with the solar minimum and everything else to do with the sun. People, people seem to not realize that they will control the sun. As I was well. going to, I, just since you said that, I want to just hop in for a second here. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, I, I don't feel like we are looking at the same sun that we had when I was little. Um, you know, when I was little, the sun was like a nice yellow, orange, warm, right, kind of thing. And now every once in a while we get a day where it looks like that. But most of the time, it's this weird, white, shimmery thing, you know, like that is, you know, just weird. But also, sometimes the sun is not rising in the place it's supposed to rise, not setting in the place it's supposed to set. There are people that think that there is a sun simulator or a false sun. No, there are sun simulators. Yeah. Definitely. And there are approximately 300 of them is what I read. I don't know if that's true. How does that but, work? Uh, but what you're looking at, Emily, is you're looking at the sun, which is not nuclear at all. It's, it's a burning plasma orb. Mm -hmm. And you're looking through a masses and masses of nanoparticles of aluminum oxide. Mm -hmm. and Because aluminum is the number one thing they use uh, yes. for the delivery system and for the ionizing. Uh, keep the atmosphere ionized. So it, it's very white. It's very mm -hmm. white. So you're looking and that's what you're looking through. What the real sun looks like anymore, we'd have to go up to a very tall mountain mm -hmm. and take a peek and see. Because I think you are intuitively right that they are cutting off our relationship with our beautiful necessary star. Mm -hmm. I do think that's true. Just as at night, when they do the noctilucent uh, laying of chemtrails, which mm. is huge at night, yeah. yep. they are cutting off our relationship with the stars. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a, what I won't call it occult, but I will call it esoteric. There's a lot of esoteric reasoning behind all of this. And we have to, you know, if, if people who listen to your show are still materialists and, and believe that... They are not. <laughs> right. That, yeah. that this is all there is. This isn't all there is at all. And now, now that they have uh, that CERN in particular, but other particle accelerators with CERN, have sort of smashed through what used to be called the threshold or the veil, mm -hmm. uh, that is now open. And now uh, all sorts of things are happening which will further erase the line between physics and mm -hmm. metaphysics. Do you think that, like, obviously we know that there's, they don't ever do anything for just one reason, right? Like the choice of aluminum is, okay, sure, it's reflective stuff. And, you know, sure, probably they don't mind that it also creates Alzheimer's and all sorts of other Parkinson's and all sorts of other health problems. But do you think that there is something about aluminum that is very good at attracting or being able to draw in certain kinds of entities or energies and almost like a magnet, right? Or something for them to sort, to sort of latch onto as they come in, right? If we're ripping open uh, holes in the fabric of space and time and letting things in from other dimensions, is, is the aluminum somehow 
like a way, you remember when you were little and you would do like, or maybe not when you were little, but when I was little, there was Etch-A-Sketch, right? And it was like a magnet that had all these particles and you would kind of control that with the magnet to make the design. And I'm sometimes wondering if some of these entities or energies are particularly attracted to certain kinds of metallic particles as almost like. Well, the thing about aluminum, uh, and it's only one of the metals, right? There are, there are many that are, yeah. are being spewed. Uh, aluminum is the most, right? It is because it's cheapest. Yeah. And it has four times the surface area of just about any other metal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it does produce a certain acidity factor mm -hmm. in, uh, in the air as it's, uh, as it's uh, becoming uh, ionized, as it's, there's an ionization going on. And that acidity, just sheer acidity, is very attractive to entities. Yeah. Well, in just fact, I, I would say that body. Yeah. most health issues can be uh, greatly helped by paying attention to the pH factor yep. of acidity and alkalinity. I've been um, pretty much macrobiotic uh, for 50 years and no doctors, no pain, no, no nothing. I'm, I'm probably 20 pounds overweight from sitting at my computer, but <laughs> I'm really not at all ill or anything. And um, I think it's uh, because I pay very close attention to acidity, al alkalinity. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something I would highly recommend to people. And if they don't know the difference for various foods or how they eat and, uh, you know, uh, or maybe they've fallen prey to massive disinformation campaigns, uh, you can always get a, a, you know, a, a pH paper and yep. uh, just put your some tongue or on, it, on it, either or one, yeah. on it or yeah. something in order to see how your body's doing. I can mm -hmm. pretty much tell just because, you know, I've been doing this so long, but if I cheat on a day, you know, and have a lovely glass of red wine with someone, uh, then the <laughs> next day I'll make up for it. Yeah. I, because I know it's acidic. I know exactly what uh, it means. And so I will compensate. Uh, it's yep. like a yin yang thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in terms of yin yang, because I studied Chinese medicine. Myself as well, yeah. <laughs> yes, very, very helpful. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, let me just continue this list and then we can just go wherever we go. So, right. I did the planetary geophysical operations and I mentioned uh, the Soviet astronomer Kardashev and his three steps. The third step uh, after controlling our star is to control the galaxy and its systems. I mean, you know, you almost want to laugh. In fact, I have laughed, uh, but <laughs> they are serious. They are serious about that. Right. Um, okay, so uh, then the fourth operation is directed energy weapons. Mm -hmm. And that would include, uh, that is a huge category because it isn't just the LRAD and the ADS and, uh, uh, um, psychotronic uh, weapons. It, it's everything. I mean, I, I can make a case for the cell phone. You know, I don't oh, know. Oh, totally. Well, it's, I mean, it's everything from LRAD to Dr. Judy Wood's work on, you know, where did the towers go to our cell phones to targeted harassment to, you know. Yeah. 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 Electromagnetics in general are mm -hmm. a tremendously versatile weapon because mm -hmm. it's invisible. And all you need is the uh, is the type of technology that will do the job. Yeah. So, um, all right. So that's the fourth operation, uh, I believe. Five. No, maybe that's no. It is. And then the fifth operation is surveillance and neural operations, mm -hmm. and that is kind of the direction I'm going now. Talking about like brainwave entrainment, neural networking, this kind of stuff? That and nanotechnology. Yeah. Very important to this. Artificial intelligence, uh, RNM, remote neural monitoring, uh, electromagnetic targeting of populations, and 5G access to DNA. Mm -hmm. So um, all of that and more are in that neural surveillance. A lot of people wonder why they want to surveil and keep track of everybody's data. Well, when you have an AI system that can do so much, you can actually use all that data if you want to control people. Yeah. So all that data will be crunched and the algorithms are ready and waiting for all that data. 
So then the sixth operation is the biological transhumanism operation. And that, that entails, again, a lot of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got down here hive mind Morgellons delivery, nanoparticle delivery of sensors, microprocessors, other electro-optical tech, uh, remote genetic engineering of DNA, uh, and uh, to eventually have the singularity, which basically means to replace nature. Again, we want to laugh here, but I don't think a laugh uh, will do it. Do you think we're already in the singularity? Virtual reality. Do you think we're already in the singularity and we're just talking about it after it's no. already happened? No, it's still being built, mm. but it's being built around us and in us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in it, but it, it's not here yet, not fully. Mm. Right. The full, the full uh, arrival to me will be when people, uh, I mean, <laughs> sometimes I think in my town that it's definitely arriving because people think mm -hmm. that um, th th they don't think they're slaves. Uh, they, they will laugh in their chains is totally. basically how we will know mm -hmm. that it has arrived. And I do think of the younger generations here who are all staring at their phones. Um, yes, they have it the hardest mm -hmm. because they don't have any other time to compare yeah. with what they've grown up with. Right. And I really have a great deal of compassion for them. They're, and they're not they're having public education for the, well, even private education, doesn't really matter. They're not doing the classics anymore. They're actually mm -hmm. destroying everything that we got from your Euro uh, European culture, right. uh, uh, which would be the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Reformation, all of those things. Most younger people, younger than me, they don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that is gone. The liberal arts education is gone. Uh, yeah. And and this this ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. This is an old uh, Freemason, um, other brotherhoods, secret brotherhoods. Yep. Motto. Templars, and, all that. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they're doing. We're in the chaos phase right now. If people people need to get out of their fear, and basically pay attention to the ride, because. It has a lot of information in it that has to do with your incarnation. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to it, not bury your head and want to go along with all the conditioning you've had since childhood that of, it, of basically entitlement. Basically, yeah. you know, a lot of people who want to feel good all the time, where did you get off being so entitled? I mean, that's not what life is about, uh, feeling yeah. good all the time. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I agree with you. And, you know, we have a very high, high information crowd as a group of people as our listeners. And I don't think any of them want to bury their head in the cloud, the sand. Some of them, a lot of them, myself included, are kind of in the space where like, yes, we understand that this is happening. Um, but if I'm going to be here and if I'm going to, um, get done what I came here to do on this, on this round, right? Or if I'm going to um, overcome this scenario, I have to find a way of looking at this that, that makes, you know, maybe turns it into a challenge for me to overcome or turns it into some sort of, um, you know, it makes me think of, do you know what uh, parkour is or free running? So it's this, it's a new sport, right? It's a, it's a sport, it's also an art where the idea is in an urban environment generally to get from one place to the next in the most direct, direct line. So whatever obstacles come up between you and there, you have to find a way to deal with them, whether it means going over tall buildings or whatever it is, right? So you can go on the internet and just watch a video of free runners and they've figured out ways to scale objects that you shouldn't be able to jump over. They use it to do flips and twists out of it. So they've taken something that is meant to be, an, it was put in front of them as an obstacle and they've turned it into an art form and a high achievement. So I think that is what people like, at least my crowd of people, yes. that I'm, no one I can be in their head. And what you're talking about is you need to contextualize what's going on there's mm -hmm. way too much information mm -hmm. yeah and the priorities how do you set the priorities for this 
so that you can build a, a some sort of structure in your mentation about what is going on. I like that a word. structure that you can live uh, with and in. And that's what I do. That yeah. is exactly what my books do. I am contextualizing a mass of information about the themes that are being played out right now, right now. And I find it, despite the fact that, you know, I may die of Margellans or I may get hit by a bus or the CIA may kill me, whatever <laughs> may happen, it doesn't really matter because I'm, I'm, on, my, I'm on my target. I'm on my run. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm the one who knows a lot about, not everything, but a lot about how to contextualize all this data and see how this intricate web, you know, the World Wide Web, the, uh, the uh, Skynet, whatever you want to call it, has been set up around us. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm going to try to teach people how it's been set up in us. Because yeah. we have a Skynet in us as well. And Morgellons really was the forerunner to lay out this uh, netscape inside. And, and I literally mean net, just like Elon Musk described. Right. The girl net. Mm -hmm. And it is in us. And it is already developed. And uh, it will, once 5G is put in place... I do believe they'll be able to play us like a piano. So what do we do to counter that? Well, I think I know, and it has to do with consciousness. Ah. And it has to do with the, all of us being on a similar frequency. I agree. Maintaining that frequency. I, I, could, I agree. You can't do it with new age stuff. You can't do it with intentionality and, you know, and this. And, no, you have to know things. You have to know how this works. You have to be able to stand right in the middle of it and know exactly what the contextualization is. So you know your place. And now you look around and you see the other people who know. I mean, I can always tell at talks mm -hmm. when I meet someone who's really done the work of yeah. reading the books and really done it. Not a matter of a radio show or watching radio interviews or whatever. No, no, it, it's, a, it's, it's an exercise in grasping, apprehending with one's thinking capability. That's the first thing they've taken from us, Emily, in the education process. They have taken our love of thinking, our ability to have common sense. They have taken it and it's gone from the educational institutions. And now we're on these, these, these government weapons called cell phones. I don't own right. one. Uh, and, Good and for you. I wish I didn't. Going, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and that's the rest of our thinking. So now people assume that when I say, you know, you've got to think, they're thinking, oh, well, that's intellect. I don't do intellect. Or, or that's information. I get plenty of information. No, I'm not talking about intellect. Engage, you know, engage, engage your brain in interacting with the information. I, that you, yeah. Forget the, even the brain. I don't need the brain to think. Consciousness. <laughs> yes, the consciousness yeah. is through my whole body. Yeah. It's in all my subtle bodies that are here. So to me, uh, when people say, oh, you know, I, you know I, there's just no, no way we can stop. Well, you know, there is one thing we haven't tried in all the years of human history, to my knowledge, and that's shared consciousness. And I don't mean meditating. Mm. I don't mean getting together on special times and meditating. No, I mean, I mean how you approach this technology. This is the thing. It's not entirely our enemy. I think what Ooh. is inimical to our being is that it's come too soon and we're simply, and our enemies are the guys who know that if they just give us a lot of toys and, and, you know, and, and make us feel free and throw out a few words about democracy and freedom and things that we're like, children. <laughs> we're like children. So and you're talking about the, uh, the, the balance, our spiritual evolution is not at the level of our technological evolution. There needs to be a better balance. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really, in a way, too late. 
but not for all of us. There, I believe that Rudolf Steiner was right, and you know I'm a student of Rudolf I know, Steiner. Yeah. Many, well, this, many is, this is why I felt I could have this more complex conversation yeah. about the psychology of this with you is because of your background with Rudolf Steiner and Waldorf teaching and all the emphasis on the creative power of the individual. And on thinking. Yeah. And on thinking. I mean, I love one, to think. <laughs> number one to Steiner is thinking. Yeah. And um, he he talks a lot about electromagnetics. He knew exactly what was coming. He just hoped that it could be forestalled for like maybe another thousand years. Right. <laughs> well, too bad. That's not going to happen. So now here we are. And um, there's going to be a split, he says, in humanity. Mm -hmm. And the split is going to be that some people are going to go the way of basically slavery to technology mm -hmm. where the machine runs them and they right. virtually become machines virtually. That's the important word. Yeah. And the other is the people who, who are be many, many fewer, many fewer who will choose to keep the humanity and the habits that have kept humanity on the very simplest level so that we can continue our spiritual evolution on the planet. Yeah. Now, most people are worried about the planet. Believe me, this is a living planet and it will not be allowed on in any way, shape or form that this planet will be utterly destroyed. No, no. I'm very glad to hear you say that. Yeah. No, no, that's not going to happen. Do you know how, how much that would take? No, no, no. That's not yeah. gonna happen. However, that said, there will be challenges for various regions. That would be mm -hmm. the humans and all the living creatures of the area. Uh, the weaponization of planet Earth uh, is, is, as Rosalie, Dr. Rosalie Bertel, the famous uh, nun and epidemiologist, said, mm -hmm. she wrote a book called, uh, you know, the, um, the Weaponization of Planet Earth. Yes, yes, they, how clever of them. They've turned our whole environment against us. And they've turned it into something that they can use for trans, a transhumanist shift in us. And that's what is going to be coming with the 5G and a variety of things that are not being that discussed in the, in the media, even the alternative media. So, so that's, okay, that's the challenge. I, I don't know, what's wrong with me? I find that thrilling that I've been born in an era with such large challenges. Me too, yeah, I, 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 do I have well. grown so much more. Than yeah. if I were just, you know, on the back burner, sort of, you know, enjoying myself uh, yeah. and having lots of pretty toys. I, I, I don't know what the problem is. It's like, come on. No, I, this is this, great. This, this, this I agree with. Like this, you know, when we look at some of this as a challenge for us to overcome, then that's how I take it. Right. And uh, there's a lot of people that feel like this is just a death sentence and it just shuts them down. So that's you know for me yeah, but that's I, being pushed you know that yeah that's exactly what they're pushing absolutely Especially, i don't know if you saw uh james what's his name who from japan who does those great shows james corbett james corbett his latest corbett report was on uh on this terrible uh green uh uh green new deal no 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 it's, <laughs> no you're gonna love it when i remember it uh he's talking about how and he gets quite angry, which is great to see in James. Yeah. Uh, about how the young people are being forced into a position of fear and hopelessness that yeah. uh, in 12 years they'll be dead. They're going to die. Yeah. Yes. This is all being created whole yeah. cloth. This has nothing to do with reality. This, this situation we have here, we don't know how it's going to turn out. But what we need is all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. We need people to really take this seriously and get out of the conditioning of being entitled to an American lifestyle that I guess some, I mean, I was raised as a peasant and a farm girl. I, I never felt entitled. I've been, you know, I've been working since I was very young yeah. and, and uh, growing. I don't, I don't know where this came from, uh, but, uh, but whatever it is to really, uh, set the example for the young around us, uh, 
Not that they'll take your example or, you know, or maybe they'll misconstrue it. Who cares? You take your responsibility yeah. and then we move into a frequency that I don't, I, you know, I totally look forward to. Uh, I mm -hmm. want that frequency. I don't want to be the one out front and, oh, Ilana is so smart. She knows how to. No, that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. This is about dedication and commitment. Yeah. And and doing the hardcore study until I break through and understand something. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm good at. Yes. Yeah. And I am smart. But the best thing about me is I have an attention span and a discipline lifestyle you wouldn't believe. I am a soldier working for the future of humanity. That's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I get it. And a lot of us feel, a lot of us have things that we're good at that are different than what you're good at, but we feel like we are also here at this time for the very same purpose, to help liberate, you know, the few humans that still want to be liberated. Yes, from... but without understanding technology, Emily, it's not going to work. Oh, I agree. I, I, I'm to understand what's I am going no, on here. I am no uh, Luddite, you know what I mean? Like, I, I have one of these brains that, you know, it's so, um, whenever I hear, like, you know, when, whenever some I, thing is laid down about this new technology that is going to do this, that, or the other thing, my brain carries it way, 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 way farther out to the point where, like, I can't even explain to people in words that would make sense to them what I see as a possibility from it. So I've dealt with, you know, a certain level of, um, uh, paranoia about technology in terms of what I see coming from the very beginning when I started waking up and I've gotten to the space where it doesn't bother me anymore. But I, under, I understand, you know, a lot of this technology and the way that it interacts, not only with other technology, but with human consciousness and, and, and you know, with, with, with all the different levels of stuff. I mean, I understand just from my own experiences, but also from what my brain does with information, all of the possibilities. And I agree with you. Like, I don't think just saying, I don't like technology as an answer to this. Like, you know, you, you can't, you can no longer ever anywhere totally go off grid. So saying, I don't like technology is not going to work, you know, so. And yet, and yet, and yet to use it. So, yes, um, I, I think the question to, if, if people still, when they read about technology, like in my books or, or wherever, uh, if their first question is, does this make me feel good or does this make me feel bad? That, that's not the question. I agree. Should be, yeah. should be asked. No, that I one agree. Is, th this is an adult world here. Yeah. It is not about being a child anymore. I mean, we have a whole culture, Emily, taught to be children forever. I agree. Yeah. And we need to really look at our adult obligations and responsibilities and i don't mean about your bank statement i mean about you know your <laughs> spiritual bank statement maybe but yeah. uh but the well that's the, that's the purpose of the bank statement is to to distract us from the more important issues for sure <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's that side of us that um that has not been tapped fully mm -hmm. you know we're all off on, on our little trips uh going this way and that but but what if we would learn about this technology and understand the challenge, just like George Patton standing there in North Africa or in the fields of France, looking out at uh, the German forces arrayed against him and, uh, and making a plan, making a plan because he has been reading all the way, battle plans all the way back to Caesar's Gallic Wars. He knows battle he has studied battle right and that's what i need i need people who really can study not just feel and wing it and sail by the seat of their path i really i i'm really looking for people who are serious about reckoning with this technology snafu that we have now fallen into yeah and it will go on emily and when i come back as someone else I'm still going to be on this and I'm looking for recruits. And am I, am I joking? No, I'm not joking. No, I'm I don't think you're those, joking. Yeah, no, I'm I don't think you're joking. <laughs> very old souls. Yeah. I know exactly what I'm talking about. So, so let's, let's get 
let's get on it here. And my books, I, I mean, I'm still amazed that I, I'm the only one who's written about the space fence. I, I just find it flabbergasting. Well, I think, I think, and actually this is something that I really like. I, I mean, I, I think your work is amazing. One of the things I really enjoy is that you have not gotten, you pick through everybody's work and you find the part that is important and you pull it out and you synthesize it and you don't get caught up in what the personalities are doing or you know if you know there's some other part of their work that isn't relevant or is a distraction you're able to go through a, you, i mean you you haven't just selected that you like this version of the narrative you've looked at all of the narratives you've looked at all of the stuff and you've done a great job at synthesizing there's some people who are so invested in their narrative that they can't see how maybe even this, this other person over here is wrong about a lot of stuff they're on to this one part that actually explains the thing about your piece that doesn't make sense and you know what i mean so i know very well what you're saying i am yeah. in a movement full <laughs> of those so-called leaders yeah, I, I bless them. They're my brothers. We're all in this together. But I do get tired of it. Yeah, I really do. I really do. But I no, I, I it's all hands on deck for me. I'm a yeah. team player. I've always yeah. a real one. I, I mean, I'm not interested. I always call myself from the Waldorf movement, a recovering leader. Because yeah. I, I was a leader for years uh, in many ways, and I don't want to be a leader again. That's why I write books. Uh, yeah. I want to. I, I want a team who understands the challenge we're up for here, but is willing to do the detailed work to really get a good mental picture mm -hmm. of that that Nazi army out there in northern Africa and on the fields of France, because. This is a Nazi mentality that is taking over. There's no mm -hmm. question in my mind. It's it's the Third Reich. I mean, all they did was move it to to the United States. To America. That's did we get, Did we get to number seven, or did we go off into a pocket universe? No, no. After number, six? number seven is what Mufon is probably <laughs> waiting for with bated breath right now. All right, let's hear number seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you yeah. for reminding me. Of course. Um, that is the uh, detection and obscuration of exotic propulsion craft. Mm -hmm. And that's where Sean Gatro's very valuable work comes in. Yeah. Is there are often craft, some sort of entities, many of them triangular, mm -hmm. hiding in cloud cover. This not, it's not real serious cloud cover, it's mm -hmm. plasma cloud cover. And even there are entities up in those clouds who can produce their own plasma cloud cover, which is, is just way cool. Yeah. Whether they are ours or the entities that James Trevor Constable took many photographs of out on the desert uh, in uh, California, I don't know. I mean... Mm -hmm. There are organic entities that have lived in this atmosphere yes. and swim in the sky. Yeah, there's, uh, an, like there, there's an ocean above, just like, like there's it, an ocean below, yeah. And that's what the Vedas call it. They call it the ocean of space. Yeah, I mean. And so there are entities uh, that are here. And uh, I, don't, I don't see that that's any type of uh, woo-woo. That just Did you ever sense. see that? Did you ever see the video that Sean took when he went to the aquarium and he saw a ray that was moving just like some of his triangular craft yes. and he was like, uh, oceans above folks, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I have encountered one of them. I, yeah. I literally have encountered one and that was many years ago. And that, uh, that particular entity was um, shaped like a very, very, very large skate fish. Yep. Yeah, I know, I know the kind you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I could tell that it's it was not metal. It, it was, does not. It was not a metal ship, but mm -hmm. it had portholes. Mm -hmm. And the the uh, out outer ship, if I could have touched it, it was about probably 20, 30 feet over my head. Mm -hmm. If I could have touched it, it would have felt like a skate fish because we we used to die. Um, we used to dissect sharks uh -huh. when I was in biology. I did biology at University of Hawaii. Uh, and, um, and I could tell that, uh, yeah, it was a lot like a shark fish. And of course, they shapeshift, right, Emily? Yep. They can take any form they want. So it took that form, 
and um, and yet I could feel the consciousness of that entity, mm-hmm. and then I was facing it, and I knew that if I had been afraid, it might have been an abduction scenario. That's these 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 craft or these entities or whatever they are. They have telepathic communication abilities. Yes. You know, one of the I've recognized that and experienced myself for many years, but it's not very often that you get a witness to this. Yeah. And it's really interesting. After just after we had you on the last time, I went on a trip with a mutual friend of ours and 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 a friend of hers. And we were in Colorado, and, and we were up on the mountain, the, the, just two of us were, and uh, this per, one of these people was not familiar with these kinds of craft and entities in the sky. And I looked up, and I saw that there was some there, and I started talking about them to her. And as I was talking about them, they started doing exactly what I was saying, and she couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? I, literally, I was talking, she asked me, you know, are they alien? I said, I don't know if they're alien. I don't know if they want us to think that or not. At that moment, it shifted into looking like a gray head, right? <laughs> like it just, like, I mean, and then, there, you know, it's, it was kind of like when you were little and you thought you could tell, say what animal the cloud was and it would turn into that kind of thing, right? Yes. But these, these entities or ships or whatever they are, they have telepathic consciousness. Oh, you know what yes. I mean? And, and they're, they will play with you. They will communicate with you. And if you show fear... Like they may abduct you or they may oh, do something, true. they may yeah. do something that you perceive as an abduction, which isn't one at all, but because you're afraid, that's what it seems like, right? Well, the fear, yeah, there's, there's nothing good to say about fear. Yeah. Uh, if, if one has fear of um, dying in 12 years, they need to really uh, talk to someone and figure that out because right. yeah. it's going to warp. Everything. Every single thing they do or think. So uh, fear is uh, is foreign to me. Not that I haven't had fear uh, in various earlier years, but not these years, not at all. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that's the seventh operation, and I am not an expert on it. I haven't seen another one of those guys mm. since that one, and I'm quite happy and i do feel that it came because i i actually called it right they I do see one I they do one. yeah yeah so um uh when i when i go to talk to mufon uh i will talk about sean gatro's um i'll talk about those the, the, yeah. in the clouds and i'll talk about the tr3b and the aurora yeah. uh all all of this is well, going yeah. on and it's, it's the interplay between some of them that's so fascinating as well, because you see some of these uh, entities or ships creating certain kinds of exhaust and then others coming along and, see, and seeming to consume it or seeming to react or dismantle because of it. Yes. And, yeah, it's so fascinating. And some of them are ours and some of them we don't know what they are. Well, and, and what we're looking at is because the and here's part of the good thing uh that's coming from all of this despite what is what it's doing to us in our lungs and our bloodstream and brains um is that there is now a plasma <clears throat> atmosphere and for some reason these entities can be seen better yes as, and that has to do with CERN having uh, opened the threshold, the veil, whatever, too soon, too soon. All sorts of things are mixed the in. The veil has thinned, yeah. That are not good. Yeah. But this is, this is how humans have always been. Yeah. Is, uh, we're, we're innovative. We, uh, we, we want what we want when we want it. We don't necessarily... Um, we're not necessarily rational at the right moments. Uh, all of this, it's all there, but it's, it's so fascinating to live in a time like now where this, you know, when Kennedy, uh, in my generation, when Kennedy talked about the space, the space age, and he, of course, wanted to work with Khrushchev and Russia, and that simply could not be allowed. And so, you know, that's one other reason he was assassinated. But uh, the, the, space age is now in earnest 
going because of the Tesla technology, because yeah. because of the HARP technology that Bernard Eastland's patents, that he was able to see how they could uh, they could change and transform the relationship with the ionosphere, mm -hmm. so that they could impregnate this entire atmosphere with plasma or with the ingredients of plasma. They've got all of their radar installations, their NEXRADs, the lasers, everything on the ground that is part of the space fence. And then up above the planet, they have this uh, band now forming around the equator, which is loaded with uh, nano heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And so between that and just like on Saturn, that's why I, I was going to say, is that like the ring of Saturn, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the picture I have on the front of my book is yeah. my earth, earth is surrounded by a ring. And so we're between, right? We're between all these uh, infrastructure that are electromagnetic and zapping uh, all these heavy metals and a lot of other things that are up there um, in, in order to make plasma this, that, and the other and experiment with plasma, but we're caught, we're caught in the crossfire between these, 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 uh, the thing above the planet and the thing on the planet. So that's our condition, and we yeah. need to know that. It isn't a matter of, well, I don't like Trump. You know, that has really nothing to do with this. Nothing, right. absolutely nothing. Does he know all this that I'm saying? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. So uh, let's get over the idea of the authority figure can fix everything. That is not true at all. There are certain people who've run this planet for thousands of years, in my opinion. So um, this technology uh, is very dangerous, but it is, it is the direction we're, we're now heading because we have allowed this to grow up among us. We didn't pay attention when mm -hmm. you know, I tried to wake people up decades ago. I said, you, you have no idea what's coming. You know, you got to pay attention. Well, it's just how people are. We're, yeah. You know, basically everybody's self-interested and wants to think about their own little thing. So, um, so now here we are and, uh, it's very exciting. Um, I mean, I, am I missing something here? Uh, nobody's at the door to kill me right now. Nope. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm discovering things that very few people realize it yet and trying to write them in books so that in 50 years someone can read those books and uh, and realize that somebody was awake here about what was going on and um and i i think it's i think it's great i don't know am i missing something emily <laughs> i don't think so i think for me i'm the kind of person that would always rather know than not know so you know for for me you know knowledge however disturbing some of it might be is just an opportunity for me to level up i mean some of the things that are happening with just like what you were talking about there are people discovering their own mm, inner power their own metaphysical gifts their own with with along with some of this is because it's what they're having to do to overcome some of this so no i think we actually live at probably one of the most amazing times to be alive and yeah. you know and i also think that you know that, that, that these challenges are uh, actually going to make us, you know, help us to recognize our own power and our own divinity and, and whatnot. And so, okay. Yeah. So the so only other thing that I think I don't want to forget to say is uh, even though I've in a way, cause you're so, you're so easy to be with uh, on the radio. Oh. <laughs> um, I've come in at all of the things that I talk about from the, basically the back door and the windows and maybe the cracks in the floor. So I don't know how clear an idea it is for the beginners out there. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about it, but I would say this, if, if somebody asked me, Ilana, what can I do to, um, to take care of myself mm. during this time that I'm breathing in basically uh, I'm breathing in heavy metals on a nano scale and a nano just for people who don't know is one billionth of a meter. So nanotechnology is chapter three in my under an ionized sky and everybody needs to know about nanos because they're in all of our foods. They're in all of our clothing they're in all the pharmaceuticals, they're in everything. And they are not 
just small, they, they behave differently mm -hmm. than anything natural. In fact, they, are, they have a swarm mentality. Yes. So they are basically alien, I would say, absolutely. And they are everywhere. And, uh, you know, I just cleaned off one of my tables here. I could not believe the amount of, uh, of dust. And then I got my little 60 power microscope out and was looking at some of the fibers and dang, there they are. Yep. There they are. They're coming it's, down. It's all everywhere. Us. People need to be in constantly chelating heavy metals out of their body and detoxing chelating. and, you know, really working yes. with what they're eating and what they, I mean, we, uh, one of the, one of the things that we all need to figure out during this period of time is how to become our own internal alchemist. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So, yes. you know, that's it. You've got it. Yeah. You've got it. And the guy, of course, that I find doing the most amazing stuff on nano, particles is Tony Pantelaresco. Oh, Tony, yeah. Tony is the man. Not that I necessarily agree with his sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he sends me the most amazing jokes, I guess they are, but they're... <laughs> You're not sure. <laughs> they're not funny to me. They're yeah. like, they're like stupid, you know. Yeah. But I love Tony and he, uh, he and I uh, email quite a bit. So, Yes, Tony Pantelaresco. I take the baths uh, at least once a week. That's uh, a cup of Epsom salt, a cup of sea salt, and a cup of borax. Mm. And the borax is it to... It pulls everything out. Well, no, it's to open up the polymer wax cover that we now have on our skin. I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah. It, yeah, I know what you're talking. Yeah, yeah. You can see it shining sometimes. And the boron will just go right through that so that then the entities can come out. That's yeah. the principle anyway. So, and then Tony has the magnetic uh, triangle thing that uh, builds, uh, creates a magnetic field over mm -hmm. the body uh, in a certain area. And then they pour out. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that the way we need to go is definitely magnetics. Yeah. For these metals, right? Metals, yeah, yeah. magnetics. Makes pull sense. them out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then I mentioned the acid alkaline, making sure that your diet, you know, if you like to eat a quart of ice cream a week, you might reconsider that mm -hmm. because that will not serve your immune system. Right. And now it's the immune system that we need to help because I don't know if you've ever really thought about the immune system, but I would say well, that I'm a nutritional consultant. So yes, I think about that. <laughs> but I think it's taken millions of years to yeah. create in yeah. the body. And it is exactly what these powers, and I would include the global dynastic elite families in this, especially big pharma, what they want to tear down in us and have been working so hard for half a century now of feeding us crap uh, is that immune system. They want it down because they're going yeah. to, tr to induct us into transhumanism remotely from the environment, from the, from the weaponized environment with the help of 5G as it is being uh, put up. So that would be phased array antennas. Those are the main, the main way the 5G is gonna work on us is really the ph phased array antennas and the millimeter wave. So, so the, that yes, the more we uh, take care of ourselves, I mean, I shut everything down at night when I sleep. I sleep with my head to the north. Um, everything I do has consciousness in it. I do not necessarily go by any of my old habits. If yeah. my old habits do not serve my health so that I can last uh, a, a while longer, then uh, I dump them unceremoniously. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not attached. Yeah. Not attached. The only thing, yes, I am attached to my morning coffee. I take that. Ah, <laughs> mine too. Mine too. I take mine with a lot of fat in it though, you know, so. Oh, no, I have it just black. But, <laughs> but it, all I need is to kickstart that br big brain of mine and, yeah. and then I'm good to go the rest of the day with it. Have you ever, have you, have you ever tried the fat coffee? No. 
pouring ghee on the blue flame of knowledge in the morning, right? So I take my coffee with about 50 grams of fat in it, right? Because the brain is all fat and I can, I'll tell you, it's great. I mean, I, I, I work out a lot. It's great for that, but it's also really great for like the clarity of mind, the thinking and just the general way your body feels it, you know, it, it's a completely different experience. I'll tell you about it sometime. All right, guys, we're to the end of the, we went a little over the first hour here. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back for the patrons hour. If you want to catch the next half of the show where we're going to talk about the weirdness of the weather and all the other stuff here in Southern California, join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. We'll see you on the other side. This is off planet radio.